So in this video, we are going to be talking about more in depth into what is chirality and how to identify chirocenters given a molecule. So we already introduced the concept of chirality when we were defining what a stereoisomer is. Understand that a chiral molecule is going to have the same number of atoms compared. So remember that we're comparing two molecules. So when we compare the two, they're going to have the same number of atoms. It's just that they are going to be arranged differently in terms of space. These two molecules are going to be non-superimposable mirror images of each other. To utilize examples in real life of chiral molecules, you can actually think of your hands. So right now, if you're looking at your hands and you face them left and right, you see that they're mirror images of each other. So the fingers that you see on your left hand are going to reflect in your right hand. Now, if you put your palms down and you try to superimpose your left and your right hand, just taking one object and put it on top of each other, then those two hands are not going to be superimposable, meaning that they are not going to overlay on each other. So because they cannot superimpose, that means that hands are going to be chiral objects. Now, we also have achiral objects, meaning not chiral. An example of a not chiral object is going to be an Erlenmeyer flask that has no markings. If you will be able to overlay these two objects, you will see that they are able to be superimposed and that's why they are not chiral. So in terms of molecules, whenever we have two molecules that you can overlay them or superimpose them, then they are considered achiral. But I like to use the, uh, the term not chiral to differentiate saying one chiral center or a chiral center from the term a chiral. So I just say something is chiral versus not chiral. So how do we apply these concepts to carbon atoms? When it comes to carbon atoms, understand that in order for you to have stereoisomers that are non-superimposable, okay, on each other, you, when you compare these two molecules, they are known as enantiomers. In simple terms, if you have chiral carbon atoms, carbon, must be bonded to four different groups. So if we see the image that we have in the bottom of the slide, we have a carbon atom bonded to four different groups, hydrogen, bromine, iodine and chlorine. If we compare this molecule to its mirror image, so the difference between these two is that they are mirror images of each other, we will see that if we pick up the molecule on the right and we try to superimpose it on the molecule on the left, they are not superimposable. So because they are not super imposed of each other, then they are chiral. How do we determine if we have an achiral carbon? In simple terms, this is going to be carbon atoms that are attached to at least two of the same 
substituents. So, if we take an achiral carbon, as is illustrated in the molecule on the left, and we look at its immer, mirror image, if we rotate the molecule that is on the right and try to superimpose it, then they will superimpose, which means that the two molecules are going to be the same structure. The take home message from here is that you will be able to determine what is a chiral carbon versus an achiral carbon. So in order to practice this, I'm going to direct you onto problem 13.12, where we, you are going to be identifying if a molecule is chiral or achiral, meaning not chiral. And we're going to be doing this by looking at each of the carbon atoms in the molecule, and we're going to be determining if that carbon atom is chiral. For any carbon atom that is chiral, we are going to put a star by it. And as long as your molecule has a chiral center, overall, the molecule will be chiral. So let's go through problem 13.11 from the textbook. If we look here on letter A, I'm going to now highlight the carbon atoms that are present in the molecule. So as you can see, the first carbon is bonded to three hydrogens and the neighbor carbon atom. So that means that this carbon, so if I label them A, B, and C, carbon A is not chiral. Carbon B is bonded to an OH, a hydrogen, a methyl, and a methyl. So that means that it is not chiral because it has two whole groups that are the same. Carbon C is bonded to three hydrogens and a carbon, so that means that it is not chiral. So molecule A overall does not have a chiral carbon, so that's why if we need to label it, it's going to be overall not chiral. Let's look at uh, example B or problem B from 11 point, from 13.11. So I'm going to highlight the carbon atoms in the molecule. We have one right here, one right here, one right here, one right here. So if I label this A, B, C, and D, we have carbon A, carbon B, carbon C, carbon D. So, carbon A bonded to three hydrogens, so it's not chiral. Carbon B is bonded to a hydrogen, a bromine, a methyl, and an ethyl group. So that means that carbon C is going to be a chiral carbon, or in other words, a chiral center. When it comes to um, carbon C and carbon uh, D, they're both not chiral. Because as you can see, carbon C has two hydrogens, carbon D has three hydrogens. So overall, because the molecule has one chiral center in, chi in carbon, on <clears throat> carbon B, that means that the molecule is chiral overall. Let's look at uh, the molecule on letter C. We have one carbon, two carbons, three carbons in the molecule. So. Remember, by definition, in order to have a chiral carbon, you need to have four different groups because the last carbon towards the right 
has only three electron groups, that cannot be a chiral carbon. The methyl group, so the CH3 on the left, that cannot be chiral because it has three hydrogens. But if we look at the one that is, has the bromine, let me just put the star here for the chiral carbon. If we look at the second carbon on letter C, we have hydrogen. We're bonded to this whole group that is different from what we see on the left, and it's also bonded to bromine, so it has four different groups. So that carbon that has the bromine is considered a chiral carbon. So that means that the molecule on C, I'm just going to erase the highlighted atoms, is going to be chiral because it contains one chiral center. I'm going to highlight them so you guys see. This is where the chiral center is. This is where the chiral center is. In the last molecule, if we look at all the carbon atoms that are present, we have one, two, three, four, five. So, if I label them A, B, C, D, and E, letter A is not a chiral center because it has three hydrogens. Carbon B is not a chiral center because it has two hydrogens. Carbon C is not chiral because it's bonded to two of the same groups, meaning the methyl groups. And then D and E, because they're methyl groups, they're not chiral. So overall, this molecule is not chiral because it does not contain a chiral carbon or a chiral center. So the reason why we need to talk about stereoisomers is because they are important in biological systems. The human body is designed to accept certain molecules in a specific stereoisomer version. So to give you guys an example of why they are so important, specifically in biochemistry, I want to tell you uh, the story of thalidomide. So thalidomide, what is, it was a drug that was synthesized in the 50s, and it was used as um, a solution to women that were having morning sickness. So when it was first synthesized, back in the day, there were no FDA, there were no trials. So they basically synthesized a drug and they just gave it to humans right away. Now, understand that for a long time, thalidomide was uh, considered a wonder drug because all of a sudden the women that were having um, morning sickness after taking thalidomide were feeling much better. So they were getting alleviated from morning sickness. But then the problem was that thalidomide specifically has a chiral carbon. And this chiral carbon is right here. When the drug was synthesized, let me just highlight it. When the drug was synthesized, both compounds, so both stereocenters for thalidomide were put in the medicine. Now, while one was given the sedative um, effect that women were feeling better, it wasn't until they gave birth that they saw that the other stereoisomer of thalidomide actually was creating birth defects. That's why right now when drugs are synthesized, even down to the ibuprofen that you may have at home, you will see that it has a specific stereoisomer because our body accepts only a particular stereoisomer when it comes to these molecules that are utilized as medicine. Now, the next thing that we need to talk about is Fisher projections. And Fisher projections are defined as a way to illustrate carbohydrates, particularly monosaccharides. 
So as you can see here, these are the Fisher projections for the monosaccharides glucose, galactose, and fructose. So when it comes to a Fisher projection, pretty much what I want you guys to uh, figure out is that when it comes to this, even though we write it as a plane, these bonds actually mean something very specific. The bonds that we have specifically in the horizontal way, if we look at it from a 3D version, they're actually poke, uh, poking forward, okay? The bonds that are vertical are the ones that are facing back, okay? So, even though you guys will not be drawing specifically uh, Fisher projection uh, when it comes to uh, further chapters, I just want you to understand that the carbon atom, as you can see here, is going to be not represented at the Fisher projection, but they're going to be living here in the intercept every time we see it in a Fisher projection. So if I go to the previous slide, as you can see, there's a carbon atom and glucose here, 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 here. In galactose, we have a carbon atom here, 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 and here. And in fructose, we have a carbon atom here, here, and here. So I just want you guys to keep in mind that there are carbon atoms in the Fisher projections, it's just that uh, they are not going to be written but they are implied. Now, another thing that we have to take into consideration is the DNL notation. As I just mentioned to you guys, um, when it comes to stereoisomers, the body works with particular stereoisomers and that's just the way that nature works. So understand that it is very important, right? That we understand right now with carbohydrates and then in later chapters with amino acids, what is a DNL notation, okay? So understand that when it comes to DNL notations for monosaccharides, we are going to be looking at the position of the OH group on the chiral carbon that is the farthest away from the carbonyl, okay? so. If your OH group is on the left, then that means that it's going to get assigned an L notation. If your OH, okay, again, that is the farthest away from the carbonyl on the last chiral carbon, it is placed on the right, then that is going to get a D rotation. So for example, here we have uh, the following aldotetros, which is erythros. And as you can see, I'm going to highlight in red the last chiral carbon. So for L erythros, I have the last chiral carbon that is highlighted in red because the OH is facing the left. That's why it's L erythros. If we look at D erythros, which is going to be the enantiomer, of L erythros, we're going to see that if we highlight the last chiral carbon that is the farthest away from the carbonyl, the OH is pointing towards the right. So that's why it is designated the D isomer. So the picture that we have here of Samuel L. Jackson, this is just something that I received from a fellow chemist. Um, and as you can see, Samuel L. Jackson is facing the left while Samuel D. Jackson is facing the right. This is just a way that we can use an analogy for D and L notation in biochemistry.